Jen. Hi there. How are you today? All right. I was just trying to listen to Shazia's talk, so um, I'm a bit late joining. That's okay. <laughs> I'm done. I'm just going to do a quick tech check with you today. Uh, yeah. If you just want to share your slides with me again today, just to make sure nothing changed on you yeah. overnight. One second. I'm just setting of myself course. up for screen share and get my views all so I can. Hi. Hi, Dave. Hi there. Dave's going to be your M He's going to be your MC today. All right, cool. Let's see yeah. Here, so I'm mute. Okay, so I'm going to go there and share. So there we go. Yep, there we go. All good. Okay, great. Hi. Everything Hi, Dr. Martell. You... Hi, David. How are you? I'm good. Thank you. How are you? How have you been? All right. All right. That's good. You, you, you've clashed me with one of my ex postdocs. So I was trying to listen to Shazia's talk, but hopefully she can be <laughs> share her slides so I can just what you've been doing. My apologies. We'll, send, we'll make sure to send you the video regardless. Well, at least you didn't put us head to head. That was nice. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh, sorry. I could hear my, my dog in the background. That's okay. So, what I'll do is I'll just pop my screen off. And then um, in about eight minutes, I'll pop back on and I can give the bio. The so intro. do you want to stop sharing and then I'll start sharing when it's time? That'd be great. Yeah, that'd be great. And that way you guys are full screen. Um, so in about three minutes, the virtual doors will open to this room. Um, you can just turn your camera and microphone off until your talk time starts. Uh, Dave will give your introduction and then you can run through your presentation and then he'll join you on screen for the Q&A. Perfect. Thank you. My pleasure. Thanks, Have a great talk. Cheers.
Okay, welcome everybody through to the session. Uh, I'm glad to have you back. And I know that people are streaming in and we'll be streaming in over the next couple minutes as we wrap up the, uh, the sessions um, in the other virtual rooms. But I, I wanted to um, get started here with our first introduction. Um, first of all, thank you, Dr. Martel, for joining. It's, it's an absolute honor and a pleasure to have you have you here with us this afternoon. It's just a shame we can't all be downtown enjoying some, <laughs> some social gathering, but never mind. Maybe next like, year. Like we've done in years past, absolutely. In fact, I, I first was introduced to you through a mutual contact and friend, Diego Cantor, who I believe met you at a conference in Madrid. That's right. And he was absolutely flabbergasted to have the chance to uh, introduce and meet you at that time. I remember him having a lot of really good things and, and you were a, a, actually a great inspiration to him. So um, unfortunately he couldn't make it today, but he, he did <laughs> pass on his, uh, his best and, uh, and I'm sure he'll be interested in catching up with this, uh, the video afterwards. But let us continue. So for those who are just joining, um, and again, we'll, we'll uh, let people stream in. Um, I, I'm very excited to introduce you to Dr. Martel, who is a senior scientist at Sunnybrook Research Institute, uh, professor in the medical biophysics at the University of Toronto and a Vector Institute faculty affiliate. She is also a co-founder and CSO of PathCore Inc. Uh, her current research is focused on medical image analysis, particularly on applications of machine learning for segmentation, classification, and prediction. And she has worked on a wide variety of clinical applications, including computer-aided diagnosis for breast MRIs and the quantitative analysis of digital, digital pathology images. Uh, Dr. Martel is currently a fellow and board member of the MICCAI Society, which represents engineers and computer scientists working in medical image computing and computer assisted interventions. And she served as an associate editor on IEEE uh, Trans Medical Imaging. Together with trainees and collaborators, uh, Dr. Martel has published over 100 peer reviewed journal papers and full conference papers. And it's an absolute uh, honor to, to invite her to share her, her uh, most recent work with us today. So Dr. Matella, I'll pass it to you. Thank you so much. Well, thank you very much, David, for that very flattering introduction. So um, I'll, I'll get going because I want to leave some time for questions and I always tend to overrun a little bit. So I'm, uh, as, as David says, a senior scientist at um, Sunnybrook Research Institute. Uh, so we're actually here. This is, this is the Sunnybrook campus and you can see we're a little bit north of downtown. And I'm actually sitting right here right now. Um, so most people know that Sunnybrook is home to Canada's largest trauma center. But people often don't realize that we're also home to, to the second largest cancer center uh, in Canada and about the sixth largest in North America. So the Odette Cancer Center here is a very large cancer center that, that takes over, uh, looks after very many patients. And the Sunnybrook Research Institute has over 300 scientists in a mixture of neurology, cardiology, bone and joint trauma and so on. So we're a large institution. But today's talk, I'm going to focus on, on my work in digital pathology. And as David said, this is my declaration of conflict of interest. I'm a co-founder and CSO of PathCore, which is a company that makes uh, digital pathology software solutions. Um, but my lab, the, my research lab, is dedicated to personalized and precision medicine with, with artificial intelligence. So the, so the core concept behind, behind um, uh, precision medicine is that you take a heterogeneous population. So for example, all breast cancer patients. And within that population, different patients have different levels of disease, different prognosis, and so on. Uh, so what we do is we, we bring them into the, the cancer center, we image them with MRI, we do digital pathology, we might collect some clinical information, some genomics information, and we try and use machine learning to analyze all this data. And what we're really trying to do is stratify patients. So we're trying to identify those patients with less aggressive disease who can have minimal treatment versus those who've got more aggressive disease where we have to escalate the treatment early in order to improve outcome. This is very similar to Shazir Akbar's talk earlier on, on lung cancer. So we're trying to do the same sort of thing, but using digital pathology in this talk here. And then also what we need to do after we've given the therapies, we want to evaluate treatment response. So we want to be able to take the images after the treatment and decide, did the treatment work? Can we gain more information? And it's kind of a feedback loop. So you evaluate treatment response, you go back, collect the data, again, look for more prognosis, and again, modify that treatment plan. So it's a continual loop that we do. 
So digital pathology, I'm going to go through quickly because it's not necessarily known to everyone. So when you have surgery for, say, breast cancer, and this is a breast cancer example here, what happens is the surgeon removes tissue. This is actually a whole mastectomy here. So these are the, the gross specimens, they're called. So the pathology assistant will take the, the piece of tissue and they'll carve it into these large bread loaf sections here. And then they'll take small sections from these, these uh, tissue specimens here, so these little red boxes, and, and embed them in paraffin. This turns it into a solid block, so you can slice off these really, really thin slices. These are just a few microns thick. Uh, and then once you've got the thin sections, you can put them onto a glass slide and then stain them with some dyes that will make the structure show up. And conventionally, pathologists look at this through a microscope. And this is where things like the Gleason grade come in, uh, the breast cancer grade, and so on. So using the information seen under a microscope, a pathologist can tell the clinician how aggressive is that tumor, how likely is it to spread in future, how much therapy is, is appropriate to give. Um, now, more recently, there's been the advent of digital pathology. So these are uh, enable us to replace the microscope with these digital scanners that are capable of scanning the images at very, very high resolution. Now, these images are very large. So this is one single section of, of breast cancer tissue. So you can see this is the whole section here. And this box that you can see changing size is, is the field of view for this large image here. So you can see we have a huge range of scales, all the way from, from full magnification down to low magnification. And the scale bar here tells you how much um, what the actual dimensions are. Uh, and this gives us a particular set of problems in digital pathology that are fairly unique in machine learning. So this slide here was, was digitized at 40 times magnification. That gives us 220,000 tiles, each of them the size of a 224 by 224 image net tile. So just six whole slide images gives us the same amount of image data as ImageNet if we just tiled the whole slide. Um, so clearly we need to do something special when we start to analyze these things using machine learning. So this talk will address some of the particular challenges posed by this kind of data. So scale is very important here. Scale really matters. So we can't just take this image and then expect analyze the sort of downsampled image here. You can see some structures here in the pink and purple of the hematoxylineosin dye, which has been applied. But we can't expect to get good results. And this is an example of why. So this is a breast cancer slide, as I say. Uh, the pink areas on this are stromal tissue. Uh, the, the dark purple areas are, are cell nuclei and cancer cells and normal nuclei. And then these bright red areas are, are red blood cells here. And I'm going to put out there's a normal duct here. This is perfectly normal breast tissue. And this is a DCIS, which is a, a pre-invasive form of breast cancer. And at this scale, you really can't tell the difference. So there's no way we could apply an AI algorithm at this downsampled resolution and expect to get a good result. Um, if we move into a higher magnification, we can actually start to see some differences here now. So at full magnification, we can see that the nuclei, these purple blobs here, look rather different in the cancer situation to in the normal duct situation where they're smaller, more regularly sized and so on. So it's really important that we we um, try and, and look at the appropriate scale for this. And that's, that's kind of a whole area of research as to what scale you want to, to look at a pathology image. Now, because the scale is important, uh, we have to use some specialized tools to actually even annotate these things. We can't just use a simple um, image viewer to annotate them. We have to have specialist uh, whole slide image viewers. Um, one of the viewers we use is the freely available SEDIM viewer, which is actually maintained by uh, PathCore. As I said, I have a, a vested interest in that. But this particular viewer is free, and, and the NIH actually funded us for some time to, to build in extra plug-in analysis routines. And the advantage of this kind of viewer, and the Aperio also have other viewers, and QPath and so on, is that the pathologists, when they want to annotate structures, they have to go all the way to full magnification and then pull all the way out to low magnification. You can't really give a pathologist a small box like this and ask them to give some kind of diagnosis, because they'll always want to pull out and see what the context is and then go back in and see it. So this is one area, again, where it's, it's more complicated than regular imaging. So for the rest of this talk, I'm going to talk about one specific application of digital pathology that we've been looking into in the lab, and that's the quantitative assessment of residual tumor burden assessment in breast cancer. So 
if you have breast cancer and it's locally advanced, or if you have one of the high risk kind of breast cancers, such as triple negative or HER2 receptor positive cancer, then it's often the case that the, the clinician will prescribe some new adjuvant chemotherapy. So before you go to surgery to have that cancer removed, you'll have some kind of chemotherapy given or the targeted hormonal therapy. Now, when the surgeon then goes in to remove the tissue, and these are all post new adjuvant therapy tissue specimens here, um, we can actually get a great deal of information that's very useful to predict further prognosis from that tissue um, because we can see how the cells in the cancer have responded to that treatment before we actually took the tissue out. So there's something called the residual cancer burden index, which is highly predictive of outcome. And it gives much more in information than a simple did, did all the cancer disappear or didn't it disappear. So we can now scale it from there's quite a lot of response and just a tiny bit of cancer remaining all the way to this cancer did not respond to this therapy at all. And that's quite important for future therapy decisions. The only trouble is it's very time consuming to calculate. So a single mastectomy, uh, if, if you take out the entire breast uh, and that patient responded quite well to treatment, you're going to have to look through maybe 40 different whole slide images to find any residual cancer and then you've got to look through the lymph nodes as well to see if there are any metastases in there. It can take a pathologist many hours and for that reason this isn't part of the standard of care. So we'd like to make it so that this can be run routinely in clinical practice and this extra information can be given to clinicians to help manage their treatment. Um, so there's several different components of this and I'll go through a few of these. So there's the tumor bed extent, cellularity, uh, so these look at how many cancer cells are left and, and how were they distributed. There's something called in situ versus invasive, which I won't go into in this talk. And then we we'll also have to look at the lymph nodes to see whether there are any small metastases left, because this is kind of the, the, the indication that the cancer may have spread to the rest of the body. So we started this project many years ago. Um, Hamid Fakari was, was the first graduate student working on this. Um, he produced his work in, in 2017, where he was just using conventional machine learning methods. But one of the main things we did with this was, was generate a very high quality set of labeled data. So this is, um, as Shazia mentioned in an earlier talk, one of the challenges is we have to have trained pathologists. So Shireen Salama here is a trained pathologist, as is Sharon Epic Moses. And Shireen had to go into many different slides and, and what we did was we asked her to label all these boxes so she would choose a set of standard 512 by 512 boxes and she would label them as to how cellular the, the tissue was there and she also drew a line around the maximal tumor extent so this area here isn't all tumor inside here some of it's just tissue that's changed because of the treatment but we know that there's no cancer outside and using this data set, um, I said Mohammed started this project many years ago. He had a conventional machine learning pipeline, so he took in the images, he did cell segmentation, he extracted features, used a, sim a support vector machine to classify them. He could generate this, this feature map here where you can see the difference between cancer cells in red and lymphocytes in blue and so on. And then he basically regressed that against the cellularity score to get our output. Um, now, this was very time consuming. It took him a lot of time to tune each step of this. You have to tune the cell segmentation, you have to decide how many features to extract, train the algorithm and so on. Um, and actually, it turns out that was very inefficient. And, and since about 2014, most algorithms in, in, in digital pathology have actually been based on convolutional neural networks. So Shazia Akbar was a postdoc in my lab. So she took on the same data and basically within less than a month, she was able to train up a fully convolutional neural network to basically produce the same kind of output as here. So instead of going through all these steps, she just put the image in and outputs the cellularity. And it turns out this is a much more efficient way of doing it. Uh, and we released this data in 2019 for a, for a challenge. So what we did was we had all these uh, 69 whole slide images here from 39 patients in the training set, and we held out 18 patients' worth of data for the test set. We only ran the challenge from October to December, and, and um, we had about 317 teams register. 41 of those actually submitted entries, and 21 of those actually produced performance that was state-of-the-art compared to the pathologist. So they matched the pathologist's reproducibility and actually beat both of uh, our existing techniques. 
And the team that actually won this was, was just, um, or well, the top two teams, neither of them knew anything about digital pathology. They just knew how to run convolutional neural networks and things because it was a patch-based method and therefore relatively straightforward to take a patch and try and regress on these, these values here. Now, it wasn't completely perfect. So all 36 teams did well on patches that had fairly um, uh, regular appearances. So this is a patch here of normal breast tissue. Um, and the pathologist said 0% cellularity, and, and all the algorithms agreed with an average of 3% cellularity here. So this was a fairly typical appearance, well represented in the training data set. Similarly here, this is a, a piece of malignant tissue. The pathologist said 90%, the average algorithm is 88%. And this is a, a fairly typical area of cancer that you can see. So lots of abnormal cells, fairly tightly packed. So these were all good, but then many teams did poorly on these patches here. So this patch here, for example, is actually normal tissue, 0% uh, cellularity. But because the, the cells are quite densely packed, a naive algorithm might think it looks more like this one than this one. So the algorithms did quite poorly. Um, here it is the lymphocytes that confuse the algorithm. And these two examples here are kind of out of distribution samples. So these are different kinds of breast cancer that weren't very well represented in the training set. But I don't think this type of mucinous cancer or this, this kind of cancer here with these large areas of cytoplasm were in the training set at all. So this illustrates that with um, digital pathology, it's not just the number of tiles that you have for training that's important, but the variability in patients has to be able to um, encompass the distribution of, of patches that you want. And an area of open research is how do we, how do we detect when we are out of distribution? And that's, that's a problem we haven't solved yet. Um, having said that, we can now take a whole slide image of, of breast tissue and very quickly generate these heat maps here. So this was actually done by Chita, and, uh, another postdoc in my lab. He's been developing some self-supervised uh, curriculum learning methods. Um, so we have even more accurate results now to get these cellularity maps out. Um, and if anyone's interested in doing some work on whole slide imaging, we actually made all this information available on the Cancer Imaging Archive. So this is part of the post-NAT database on the, uh, the Cancer Imaging Archive, so publicly available. Um, so so one, that was um, an example of how we were doing patch-wise. Sometimes in, in digital pathology, we want to actually look down at the cell level. Um, now, this becomes a kind of question of scale that we have a problem of. Um, so this is a, an example of the annotations at cell level. So individual nuclei have been annotated here. And the first approach to that is that, well, you take a small patch and you decide whether the center of the patch is a, a non-nuclei, whether it's malignant, normal, or a lymphocyte. And, and the naive approach is just to move a convolution, uh, move your patch over all of this image here with a stride of one pixel, and you can produce these exquisitely detailed heat maps of, of the probability of it being a lymphocyte or malignant, malignant, malignant epithelial cell. Now, of course, this doesn't work terribly well if you're having to move over with a stride of one over a huge image. Um, so we've done some work trying to use bootstrapping. So we take the output from the previous network and train a feature pyramid network. This is work by Jonathan Mazursky, a master student in my lab. And he can now, in I think it's about half an hour it takes at the moment, he can go over a whole slide image and generate these really quite beautiful maps of malignant cells and lymphocytes and create these color overlays. But it shows that sometimes you have to kind of take a tiered approach. You have to leverage. So we could never have got a pathologist to annotate at this kind of scale. So what we do is we use a previous network, use that to generate labels and then bootstrap to get our, our better labels uh, at a bigger scale. Uh, and I'm going to run out of time very quickly, so I'm going to try and go on to this next problem here. So I've been explaining things where we've been training on patch level, um, but in practice what we want to do is do something like this. We want to take a whole slide and we want to find out where in this whole slide image is there any residual tumor. Okay. And for this RCB index, it's quite important to be able to define the convex hull around all the tumor. And, and part of the metric is these two lines here orthogonal. So, th so the task is we want to find a bounding box that encompasses all malignant areas. And on the surface of this, this is quite easy. We take our cellularity map here, we do some processing on it, and we just generate the convex hull. Um, but in practice, it's actually quite difficult. So if you can imagine, if we just have one false positive detection down here, then it's going to completely change the boundary of our convex hull. So on a whole slide image, uh, it's a very, very different problem to, to when we're just looking at isolated patches. 
Um, so Ozan was trying, a uh, PhD student in my lab, um, he was trying to figure out how to actually improve the accuracy so we can get good results at the whole slide image, where one mistake in this 100,000 tiles could really mess up your results. So what he did was negative mining. So this is a, a fairly common approach um, where you try and sample negative patches um, and you try and find harder patches and, and use those to classify and improve the results. So fortunately, we had all these, these black lines on these images, so he could just randomly sample patches from outside to try and improve the algorithm. Now, it turns out that randomly sampling doesn't help either. So you can imagine if you just randomly sample the patches from that area outside, you're going to end up with an awful lot of patches that are fairly uninformative. So all these white ones here are just, just fat. I mean, once you've seen one patch, you've pretty much seen one fat patch, you've pretty much seen them all. But things like the red blood cells are much more underrepresented. Um, things like these uh, nipple areas here are underrepresented and so on. So what Ozan's done is he's fed the patches, first of all, through a, for a feature encoder, so a, an image net, or as I'll show you later, a self-supervised network. And then using k-means sampling, so you cluster all the patches using k-means. And then what you do is you just take a few exemplar patches from each cluster, and that greatly improves the accuracy of your, your algorithm. So now you're making much more efficient use of your network using the, the data so that you get a better result. And he showed that this worked extremely well in, in his particular task. So as I say, classifying patches is a relatively straightforward problem. So we can get up to a 98.7% accuracy without using any kind of special sampling algorithms at all. And this is the confusion matrix here. So true negatives, true positives, false positives, false negatives. Um, interesting enough, his, his gaming sampling didn't work here. But when we come to the whole slide image, you can imagine that 98.7% accuracy on a slide that contains hundreds of thousands of patches isn't going to cut it. So sure enough, if you don't do any negative sampling, we actually had eight negative slides here. So eight slides that didn't contain any cancer at all, but all of them came up with some patches that were positive. So using this k-means approach, he was able to actually at least get six of these slides correctly classified as negative. And he managed to get much better overlap with the pathologist regions of interest as well. So, so the, the negative sampling is very important. Um, now, these all relied on, on um, label data. And, and we all know that getting label data in pathology is extremely difficult. It's a complex task. You tend to need pathologists to do it. It's not something you can just you take out to Mechanical Turk or something. So self-supervised learning has attracted a lot of interest in the pathology field. So the idea of self-supervised learning is that you train a network to do some kind of pretext task that doesn't need any expert labels. And this is an example of a natural image pretext task. So you take a, a patch from the center of an image here and feed it through one arm of a, a Siamese network. And then you take another patch from one of these nine locations. And the task is just to decide which location did this patch come from. Um, and the idea is that you train this network to do that. You keep the neural network at the end of it, which has hopefully learned some useful feature representation. And then you train on a downstream task with a much smaller number of labels. Um, now, we obviously can't use that kind of task for digital pathology because there's nothing about the digital pathology image that has orientation. And there's no reason to know which direction any of these patches come from. So Chitan in my lab, he's come up with a pathology specific uh, surrogate task. So here we take different patches from different levels of the image pyramid. So this is how digital pathology images are stored. And the task is to decide which order these three patches are presented in. And it turns out that this gives him a very useful representation, which means that when it comes to doing a much more difficult task, he can manage with much smaller label data sets. So this is um, one of the applications that we're using. This is to detect lymph node metastases after neoadjuvant therapy. Um, so you can see this is a slide here with no cancer, uh, and this is the heat map here, and then uh, a very highly labeled thing, the, the red things represent metastases, and you can see that he's doing a good jo job of detecting those. Of course, the next challenge is to go from these heat maps to a single label, and that's a challenge he's working on at the moment. Uh, that task is still somewhat um, specific. so. Um, what we do instead is, is another approach is Simclear, which is a completely unsupervised task. Uh, Ozan has taken a huge number of patches, 1.4 million patches, and pre-trained a ResNet model using uh, Simclear here. And this is available as a GitHub download, and this is actually a very strong 
uh, representation of the data, and you can use this to kind of bootstrap uh, other methods. I haven't got time to go into this, but hopefully on the, the digital science talk, you can have a look at it. Uh, there's an archive paper that details the results, but you basically get much be better results very quickly. And again, if you do the unsupervised cl clustering on that SimClear representation, you get very, very strong clusters. So each of these is a different cluster based on that latent representation. And you can see that you can map that to whole slide images very effectively. And this is a very powerful unsupervised method of looking at our data. So I'm going to wrap up very quickly. This is the, the current team. Um, so I have a few new people joined, but I haven't had time to update the slide. Um, and I'd like to thank all my funding agencies. So hopefully I've managed to, to leave some kind of time for questions. So thank you. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Martel. That was fascinating. And I know that you covered a lot. Um, we, we do have some questions here. Um, as a matter of fact, if you are you full screen, if you wanted to toggle into the session on the right hand side on the chat. Um, yeah, I am. Okay, so you can see those there. Okay, so question from Parnian is: Do I analyze whole slide patches individually for the cancer challenge? How do I finally get the whole slide level prediction? That's an excellent question. So going from heat maps and individual patches to a whole slide image is a very difficult problem. Um, and in fact, Shazir Akbar, as a postdoc in my lab, was addressing that problem. So she has a very nice Neurips workshop paper on that, that issue. So there's many different methods. That's an area of very active research. If you want to go to survival analysis, for example, you know that the patient survived for 10 years without cancer or they had a recurrence after four years or so. So that's a patient level uh, label, but we want to figure that out from an individual patch-based thing, so we can't throw in the whole slide at one go. Uh, now, in, in medical imaging, you can do something called multiple instance learning, where you decide that, you know, either nothing in the image is positive or there's a positive signal somewhere in the image. The trouble with digital pathology is that we can't feed in all the patches into one batch. So we don't even know whether we've got a positive instance in that batch from a positive slide, which is one of the real challenges. Uh, there's a group out of Memorial Sloan Kettering, Thomas Fuchs's group, and they showed that if you have gigabyte levels of uh, weekly labeled slides, so they just threw in Memorial Sloan Kettering's back catalog of slides and showed that with, with tens of thousands of these things, you can actually detect prostate cancer in biopsies, for example, just using a weak label. So the idea is you, you throw it through some sort of pre-trained network. So actually our, our new SimClear network might be a very good starting point for that. You, you rank the patches from a weak label, and then you just look at the most significant patches and then try and do some kind of attention network or something like that. So there's many, many different algorithms for trying to do that and, and lots of things in the literature for, for trying to do that. Um, at the moment, Chitani and my group is trying to get some good slide level predictions for those um, lymph node metastases, for example. So open, open question. So then the next question is, an expert should always extract the patches first. So, so when I was talking about the cellularity task, I said that the pathologist did choose the patches. And in actual fact, I'm doing some more work now with some hematopathologists, pathologists. And again, I'm going to ask the pathologist to choose the patches. And the reason for that is that they can choose the patches that they would choose to look at under the microscope. So the pathologist doesn't look at the whole slide uniformly. They go to an area where they can see areas that might be concerning at low resolution and they zoom in. Um, they can also exclude patches that are full of artifact and, and clutter and junk. So in a digital pathology slide, there's areas of tears and bad staining, and sometimes they draw pen markings, and sometimes the cells are all muddled up. So they can avoid those areas. Um, so that's what we can do here. Of course, when you're training on whole slide level, you want to have some of those areas because those are going to flag up as false positives or false negatives if you're not careful. So um, we, if we can, get the expert to extract the patches, but at some point the scale doesn't let you do that. Uh, and for the survival challenges, we can't ask the pathologist to extract patches because the pathologist doesn't really know where the signal is. That's one of the things we're trying to decide. So we're trying to decide eventually from the heat map, hopefully that will then give us back some information about where on the image was the relevant signal. And then we can go back and try to think, oh, what was it about that that made it important? Uh, so I'd like to be able to close that loop and actually give the AI results back to the pathologist so they can actually start to think, well, okay, that's 
that's something we hadn't thought of before, but that's indicative of a poor outcome or good outcome. So that'd be quite interesting. Have we got time for another question? Um, so Joseph asks, so this talk highlights the complexity in delivering accurate predictions using ML, even in an area that's been identified as low hanging fruit for ML. Uh, yes. Uh, so there's a huge no amount of investment capital uh, investment money going into AI companies. So Page AI, Path AI, um, AI4, tons of companies are ra raising millions of dollars for this because it's regarded as low hanging fruit and Google as well. But it is very difficult. So, so what we're lacking at the moment is, is high quality AI algorithms are actually being deployed in practice. So some of the algorithms I've showed, we actually show that we can go from our data to Memorial Sloan Kettering data to other data and actually it still works. But we have to validate that in, in bigger cohorts. Um, so you have to know whether, you know, if the stain variation is too much or different resolution or different slide scanners use it, you have to make your own algorithms robust and generalizable. And then not only that, you have to pick problems that pathologists care about. So there's no point in saying, oh, well, we're going to diagnose breast cancer or pathology slide because the, the pathologist is going to give us a huge shrug. And then, then they're going to show us 10 examples that our algorithm will fail on because they're kind of these out of sample cases, these edge cases that they're, they're slightly funky. A pathologist may see one or two of them a year, but they know about them. We don't. Um, so it's things like measurement, quantification and so on. So AI has been used in cytology. So cervical smear tests um, have had machine learning algorithms applied to them for decades. Um, and it automates a time consuming task. It does it with high accuracy and, and it's not con controversial. So hopefully we'll get to the same point with digital pathology algorithms. Dr. Martel, can you mention, I guess, as a last parting question, uh, can you talk a little bit about Pathcore and the, what was the impetus for starting that and, and the intuition that you had that you, you know you thought this was going to be a unique opportunity? Okay, so Pathcore came about because back in, gosh, I think it was 2008 or something, one of my colleagues, Martin Yaffe, was developing these whole mount images. So these huge digital slide images and a company in, in Waterloo called Huron were, were, were the only scanner company in the world that could actually digitize these things. But the viewing software wasn't very good. And as a scientist, I wanted to be able to move images around and develop my own plugins and so on. And, and the um, existing commercial software, even though you could get a free viewer, wasn't really up to it. So I wanted to develop a, a viewer in my lab that could be expanded for research. So Danush Hosenzade was a very talented software developer. He came and joined me and developed this, uh, this uh, viewer, which is now the Sedim viewer. Um, and then we decided, well, where do we go from here? And, and he was very keen to, to try and deploy this out clinically. Um, in the end, what we've done is, is developed a company that actually does workflow. So as any AI venture capitalist will tell you, it's all fine and good having a great model, but it means nothing until you can deploy it. So actually, Pathcore's main business model at the moment is on the the kind of infrastructure, the, the nuts and bolts of how do you save images, archive them, database them, serve them to pathologists, allow them to report them. So it's an image management system. And now uh, I'm very excited that we have an Innovate grant with Pathcore at my lab and Pathcore. So we're actually going to be able to start plugging in some AI models into that. Um, and Pathcore also uh, sort of uh, has a, a plug-in interface that other companies can put in their algorithms. So hopefully we'll start developing some path core AI algorithms, but we'll also have a platform where people who have algorithms will be able to deploy it but via this, this existing platform. So how do you get the, the models to the pathologist? That's a totally non-trivial problem. And I'm sure many people on this call know the concept of having cool AI models that their students have developed or in their lab, but no way of giving it to a clinician and making it work. So, so that's kind of the next step in, in, in evolution is deployment is, is kind of my thing for the next couple of years. Deploying these uh, absolutely. And I'm sure that will, that will be a uh, very helpful tool for, for many folks. It's, it's something that so many struggle with. So brilliant, brilliant work. Thank you so much, Dr. Martel. I really appreciate you taking the time today. Okay, thanks a lot. Take care.